Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm M Seeker of Truth. I'm a uh, truth seeker, content creator, researcher, and grift buster. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Are there any truth seekers in the building? Fantastic. Not alone then. So it's been a bit of a you know a weird one over the last couple of years, hasn't it? And during that time, a lot of people have come out of the woodwork uh, with some extraordinary stories. And I guess that's kind of what grift busting is about and what got me into that is looking into some of these stories and looking into some of these extraordinary claims. Anyway, I'm here today not to talk about me. I'm here to uh, actually interview a very interesting guy with a very interesting story. Uh, and his name's Gary McKinnon. So we welcome on stage Gary McKinnon. Righty-o. <laughs> In which case, let me tell you another story. Yeah, so another example of grift busting. Uh, there was a guy that was claiming himself to be the rightful king of England. And when I uh, looked into it, he, you know, he also claimed that he was Patrick Kennedy, JFK's son. That's quite convenient. When I looked into him, there was, there was plenty wrong about his story. But the thing is, is, he knew who I was and he knew what I did. So I had to go in disguise. So I created a new YouTube channel. I donned a wig, I donned some shades. I put on an American accent. And I got him to come on camera with me. Uh, and that was a, a very interesting interview, to say the least. And one of the things I caught him out on was he said that he was 40 years old. Well, Patrick Kennedy died a long time ago. And uh, actually, he would be 47 uh, today. So I said, you know, how old are you? He said, 40. I said, but he, he would be 47. He said, yeah, that's right. I said, so how old are you? And he choked up. I said, um, I'm, I'm 40. I said, well, how does that work? It's just another example of, of some of the things that, uh, you know, I've come across some crazy, crazy characters uh, in my time. Well, I've only been doing it for two years now. But another person, uh, his name is Ted Maher. And he does a radio show, I think it's called Out of This World Radio in America. And he claimed to be able to channel beings and such. And when I was in an interview with him, um, he'd said about that he regularly goes aboard a Pleiadian mothership. And so I asked, asked them about it. They said, I'd love to take you up there sometime. Um, so I said, oh, great, all right then. All right, then I'll come aboard your alien mothership. And uh, when, when it came down to it, he, uh, he, he got me to do some chants. I could only describe what happened next as a lead imagination exercise. He said, oh, do you feel it? We're, we're coming on board now. Oh, here you go. Uh, can you see him? It's Admiral Halasaurus who's invited you aboard the spaceship. And then from there, it got wackier. It got wackier. He ended up uh, taking me to the zoo that was on board. Uh, I met a talking elephant. And then he took me to some screening room where he says that you could go anywhere, anywhere in the world. Uh, and he said, let's go to the beach in Hawaii. So I said, yeah, yeah, fine. And he took me there and said, oh, can you feel the, the warmth on your skin from the sun? And he said, uh, I said, yeah, yeah well, no. <laughs> But yeah, okay, I'll play along. And uh, he said, let's go for a swim. So yeah, I actually took my top off on the, on the stream and started swimming. But yeah, some funny, funny characters out there. And the problem is, these days, there's a, a, you know, especially, especially over the last couple of years, lots of people come out of the, of the woodwork. And the waters of truth are murky enough as it is. So I think it's very important that, you know, especially with some of these more extreme stories, that we, you know, we check them, we, we research them, and we try and see, you know, are these guys legit? Because uh, if they're misleading people, if they're profiting off the, off the either vulnerable or people just trying to find the truth, I think that's really bad. And, and I think if, if people can do that bit of extra research uh, and, and, and listen and be open-minded if you, if you believe in someone and someone tells you, well, look into this because he lied about that, I think it's really worth looking into. So, yeah, I mean, I, I've been interested in conspiracy theories uh, and alternative truths. Um, alternative truths for well, 18 years now. Um, I started off by looking into sort of UFOs, the Roswell, you know, 9/11, things like that. And I always wanted to to carry on looking into you know truth seeking and uh, and perhaps somehow spread you know things that I'd found. And uh, a YouTube channel was a good way of doing that. But I actually ended up um, doing the grift busting more than the truth seeking. And 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 when I was doing videos on things like the Mandela effect and, and other things. Um, people were commenting, well, who are you going to expose next? And, you know, I'm not out here, I'm not, you know, doing these things to expose people. I'm just looking into it like a truth seeker, like anyone else. And if I find some red flags, you know, I'm going to share them. But 
yeah, it, it, it seems that people want me to to do the grift busting part uh, more often. Uh, but it is, it is, it's an interesting thing. You know, the truth seeking as well. There's so much out there that you know we've been lied to about. There's so much out there that, that's not quite right. That we've been indoctrinated into. And you know, I think the truth seeking is extremely important. So, and and saying that. Gary McKinnon, I, I first saw him about 17 years ago on uh, Project Camelot with Kerry Cassidy. And uh, he did an interview then. And, and his story basically is that he managed to gain access uh, into NASA computer systems and military computer systems. And whilst he was there, he saw some interesting, to say the least, stuff. Um, so I'm really excited to, to speak to him more. I'll let him tell you what he found. But the US tried to extradite him. Tried to extradite him, and, and, and God knows what they would have done if they would have managed that. But luckily, it, you know, it got blocked. So I don't know. Is Gary ready? <laughs> Can we bring Gary on? Gary McKinnon? Are you there? Hello. Come and help me. I don't know. Has anyone got any questions about uh, grift busting or anything to add, um, you know, about truth seeking and, and, and the importance of that? Well, um, I suppose it all started seeing lights in the sky. I don't know if many of you have seen some, some weird things in the sky. For me, it started off, I, I saw some lights making some unusual, you know, when you see a plane, it kind of has its trajectory and, you know, it's going one way. And satellites, you can tell what they, you know, you can tell those, you know, I know all the, the usual um, kind of, uh, the usual kind of apparent explanations for some of these lights in the sky. But when you see them do sort of triangular formations and disappear, you know, uh, and, and do them at speeds, you have to, you know, wonder what it is. I mean, by definition, it's an unidentified flying object or flying light, isn't it? So um, I suppose that's what got me into it. And then, and then later on in broad daylight, um, I did see a cigar shaped, uh, you know, classic cylindrical object um, going across the sky. Um, I was working, I think I was, you know, I was only a teenager. I was working on a checkout in a shop and uh, you know, the, the next customer was waiting for me to, to serve them. And I could see out these big glass pane windows. And I just, I just stopped. And I think at one point there was kind of, hello, <laughs> can, I, can I get served? But, you know, I, 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 I was just totally, um, you know, froze and, and just watched this, you know, in broad daylight. And, and no one else seemed to see it. It was, it was weird. It was, it was like, a, you know, I was on my own seeing it or it was only, it was only me that could see it. But and no one was looking out the window and going, oh. Um, but yeah, saw that going across the sky, and, and since then, been absolutely fascinated about you know uh, all those all those sort of things. That you know, there's no kind of explanation, and and, and do governments uh, you know we we know that they know about these things, that they've investigated these things. So, what do they know, and and, and you know, are they are they ours, or or are they something extraterrestrial, perhaps? So yeah, great question. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, let's uh, bring on Gary McKinnon. <laughs> Sorry, Gary. Bright light <laughs> in the bright lights. It's it's great to meet you. Uh, we did we did meet briefly beforehand. Sorry, I'm a bit late. Got stuck at the bar. You got stuck at the bar. Well, it's better than uh, getting the wrong train like you did in another interview. I hear. That's a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> but you're here. You made it. Here. Better late than never, eh? Yeah. Yeah. I've already kind of briefly explained your your you know your story is you managed to. I didn't say hacking. I would, you know because I don't know if you'd call it hacking, but you managed to gain access on uh, to some, some you know, NASA systems um, and some, some other military systems, is that right? Yeah, it was more um, password cracking. Um, so the news would have you believe at the time, oh, computer genius, evil computer hacker. Um, but it was more to do with their stupidity than my genius, because there, there was no genius. Um, I wrote a script that scanned for blank passwords. Um, you know, if you work on computers, you have a password, it can be complex or not complex, these were military systems, government systems, and they were actually blank. There was no password. Some of them were actually password, and some of them were the name of the account. So it was crazy. So you're right, it wasn't hacking, it was password cracking, and very easy password cracking at that. So what does that say, uh, really? Um, that says a lot, I suppose, about <laughs> the, the security of the, you know, these systems. Very poor. 
uh, made a big mistake there. Yeah, very poor. Um, no firewalls, as you would normally have. And also, I, I basically did a very old method known as um, trust relationship exploitation. Um, so I would hack into a contractor that worked for the military or the government, and they were already trusted by the network, and from then you can step in. So, yeah. You found some interesting things um, whilst you were looking around on there. What sort of uh, method did you use to find these things, and, and what did you find? Um, I'd read the, you know, Stephen Greer, the famous UFO guy? Yep. Yeah. I'd read um, his book from the Disclosure Project, and uh, one of the witnesses, Donna Hare, she was a NASA photographic mission launch slide expert. And um, she had secret level clearance because all, all the hardware in NASA is, is very secret. Um, and she did technical photography so they could analyze the launch, see what went wrong, what went right, etc. cetera. And um, she worked in Johnson Space Center, uh, specifically in Building 8. And I'd already hacked Johnson Space Center. And she said, just across the corridor, she had a colleague and these are meant to be compartmented. They're not really meant to communicate. Um, but she said her friend across the corridor uh, one day invited her in to his room, his lab, and um, said to her, Donna, you're a photographic expert. Come and look at this photograph and see what you think. And um, he showed her this high resolution satellite image um, of, a, I think it was a forest. And um, there was a huge white disc floating above the trees. And being a, a photographic expert, and it being the days of analog photography, not digital, um, she said, well, is it a blob in the emulsion? You know, her brain's looking for conventional explanations at first. And he then pointed to the shadow and said, well, blobs in the emulsion don't have circular shadows beneath them. And to cut a long story short, um, this was an airbrushing lab in Johnson Space Center, whose only sole function was to airbrush out images of UFOs from high-resolution satellite photography because they're so preponderant in the atmosphere. And um, that was her. She was one of the witnesses, one of 400 witnesses, I think. And I thought, well, I'm already in JSC, Johnson Space Center. Um, I'll have a look. And uh, when you've got admin access to the network, as I did have, um, you can run commands. Uh, NASA are very good at um, auditing because they're a government. They're actually military, but they're supposedly a government uh, department. And you can use, they're all on Windows, running normal Windows. And you have these comment fields, so you know which room the computer's in, what its serial number is, all basic auditing. Um, so I ran a command to find out which PCs were in Building 8, because it lists the building, the floor, etc. And uh, there were only a few, like probably less than a dozen. And um, I got all the machines that were in Building 8. Um, they all had weak or blank passwords. And the first one I looked at had um, two folders, um, like raw and filtered or processed and unprocessed. I can't quite remember the, the folder names. Uh, but these images were huge. Um, this was in the days of dial-up modems, 56K. Uh, it would take like 15 minutes to download an MP3, a song. You know. Yeah, I remember those days. Yeah, yeah. To, to take a while to uh, to actually get an image on the screen. Then oh yeah, was it? <laughs> yeah, like line by line. Yeah, <laughs> and um, so I was going to transfer it. I thought this looks just like what Donna Hare said. She's absolutely bang on. Um, but 230, 250 megabytes plus, and it was five minutes per megabyte in those days. So wow. a long time. Yeah. Um, so I just double clicked on the first one. And that launched the, um, also it was proprietary NASA software to view the images. I probably couldn't have viewed them at home because it's their own specialist software. So I double clicked the first image on the list and it started coming down, you know. And I was using um, something like PC Anywhere. This was called Remotely Anywhere. You can see the desktop remotely. You can move the mouse around just like you're sitting at the machine. And um, it slowly started coming down. At first it was just blackness and then started to see a, a hemisphere of a planet. I assume it was Earth, because um, the satellite airbrushing lab was for Earth satellites. And uh, then suddenly appeared this classic cigar shape, like you were discussing earlier. Um, no seams, no rivets, very smooth, no exhaust pipes, no rockets. Um, but it did have these sort of geodesic domes 
on top and below and at either end, either side. Um, like the golf ball domes, you see the radars at Menworth Hill. Right. Yeah. Uh, and um, that got two thirds of the way down the screen. And then I'd got my time zones confused. I was smoking a bit of weed at the time and got my time zones confused and I saw the mouse move. So someone else was actually at the PC and he went down or she went down to the, the local area network icon on the bottom right, right clicked, chose disconnect and boom, that was me. But I did get to see two thirds of the picture. That was my eureka moment, but also at the same time I got caught. So. Wow. Um, I mean, how were you feeling at that moment? Because it must have been, uh, you, you know, <laughs> at one time to confirm kind of what you were out there looking for. And then, and then literally before the, the picture is even fully loaded, uh, you have this moment of, oh, I've been caught, I guess. Did you, did, how did you feel? Yeah, it was, totally, it was like, you know, coitus interrupts us, really. It was um, because a lot of the hacking is very boring. It's not exciting like you see in films. Um, you write your scripts. You run the scans, you wait for hours, you get the results, you trawl through the results. Um, but also wrote scripts to trawl through the results. So it's, you know, a good sysadmin automates everything. You, you're lazy. You know, the best sysadmins are lazy sysadmins. Um, but yeah, it was yeah, a really good feeling. And then the oh shit moment <laughs> at the same time. And then I'm just thinking, oh no, when, when will it come? You know, when will the, uh, the tap on the shoulder come? Uh, and it and it did, ha, ha, didn't it? Uh, they, um, you got visited by what cyber crime unit? Is that right? Yep, the National High Tech Crime Unit. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, how long? How much longer after that happened were you were you visited? That's a good question. I think um, it was late two thousand and one when I found the the UFO picture, and I was arrested in March two thousand and two. Um, so it might have been three. Four, four months at tops. Um, but it turned out the NHTCU, National High Tech Crime Unit, um, were actually, because they'd got, the Americans had told them, oh, it's from this British Telecom and BT internet address at this time. So they contacted BT, they said, oh, it's, um, but at the time I was living with my girlfriend at her auntie's house, and uh, it was in my girlfriend's name. She obviously left me after all this. <laughs> and, um, so they, did, they didn't know who they were looking for. There was like you know, me, my girlfriend, her auntie, um, her auntie's son and daughter. Um, so they, they put up physical surveillance, apparently. But I never left the house. I still was you know, sitting there on the PC. So they didn't have a clue who they were looking for. So unfortunately, they actually arrested everyone and searched everyone and searched the whole house. And yeah. Wow, uh, yeah, it must have been quite disruptive to uh, the people you were living with, your girlfriend and, uh, and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And that, that was the worst effect of all this knock-on effect to your, your friends, your family, your loved ones. Sure. Um, so so when, they, when they visited you, what, did they, they kick the door in or did they uh, you know, politely knock at the door and ask, you know, who, who oh, lives they, here? Um, Can I see your computer devices? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, um, my girlfriend at the time answered the door. Uh, I was still asleep because I think I'd been up all night. I think I'd stopped the hacking by then, but I'd been up all night doing something on the computer. I think it might have been um, Galactic Civilizations 3, the space strategy game. <laughs> Brilliant. So, yeah. And um, yeah, so I, I woke up very, very sleepy. I'd only had a few hours sleep. And it was uh, Jeff Donson from the National High Tech Crime Unit shaking my shoulder. Um, you know, you've been arrested under the Computer Misuse Act, 1996, whatever, da -da -da -da. and uh, took me into the kitchen, separated us both. And um, I put my dressing gown on, and I totally forgot that I had an ounce of hash in my dressing gown pocket as well. And oh, they're, doing no. pat, they're doing a pat down, but they, they missed that, thank God. But so that wasn't on the charge sheet. <laughs> wow. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't looking for that then, they were just looking for... Yeah, yeah hacky stuff. Uh. So, I mean, it's quite a traumatic thing to happen to you. You were woken up by them, uh, right? Yeah. Um, for someone, I mean, because you, uh, you weren't a professional computer uh i mean you knew a lot about computers uh, yeah. but you, you weren't doing it professionally you weren't a, a, a hacker professionally or oh no like i was that. an it professional but not right hacking oh i see yeah so yeah quite an interesting that thing to happen now is this uh i mean was there no kind of masking ip addresses back then or? at first i did um and i also used to jump through hoops i set up a, a proxy chain so i could get one machine 
I'd start off on um, like a library, I use a library or universities, stuff like that. And then from then to the contractors and from the contractors to the actual networks. And sometimes um, from a library or a university directly to the, to the military sites, because no firewalls, no passwords, no basic protection. Um, yeah. You said about you had the interest um, in sort of the UFO phenomenon. Um, was that the only? Th uh, you know, what, what were you? What spurred you on to go go delving in and and and, and trying to access all these systems? Well, yeah, I'd had an interest since uh, since a small child, uh, mainly due to my stepfather, who was you know very into sci-fi and UFOs, and introduced me to that kind of side of life. So we can all blame him now. Um, yeah, I, the main thing for me was the technology. I thought if this technology really does exist, it should be used for the good of all of us, you know, um, free energy, um, or at least very cheap, uh, incredible propulsion power, possibly anti-gravity. Um, if this is being kept secret, why? Because obviously that would be used against people if it's being kept secret, rather than fur furthering humanity. And um, at the time there were um, it was a bit of an energy crisis at the time, as there is every few years, even worse now than it's ever been, cost of living, etc. cetera. Um, but at the time, there was a very popular phrase bandied about called heating or eating. Old age pensioners had to choose whether to pay for their heating or pay to have food and then sit on their chair with a blanket and eat their food. Um, so it was a bit of, a, I've been told because of the Asperger's, it was a bit of a crazy crusade, a bit obsessive and all that sort of stuff. But to me, it's just right thinking that's right um so i mean uh, you've been told that you're your uh, asd you're on the spectrum is that right yeah yeah high functioning uh, yeah, yeah yeah apparently yeah yeah um but uh, i mean one of the because of the high profile of the case i had five leading psychologists psychiatrists whatever the right term is um analyze and run tests on me and i said to one of the guys isn't it just a personality type you know because it's not class as a mental illness per se it's more of a, a syndrome whatever that means and he said yeah i do think it's a personality type but don't quote me on that because i've written three books <laughs> on the topic so i can't say it's just a personality type it has to be you know, an accessible thing an issue a problem so uh, we talked about the the image um of the uh cigar shaped um, objects, cylindrical object that you saw. Um, but you also saw some other interesting things on some other systems. One of the things was a, a list of non-terrestrial officers. Yep, that's right. Non-terrestrial officers was a, a spreadsheet. Um, I can't remember if that... Oh, no, that was the heading. That was the actual heading in the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, possibly the file name as well on the actual hard drive. Um, and it was a list of ship names. And these weren't like US Navy ships, because I did Google them at the time. Well, it wasn't Google. I think it was uh, Deja Vu or something, the, the search engine. Ask Jeeves. <laughs> I, no, <laughs> Ask Jeeves was a bit too commercial at that time, but yeah. Um, and personnel, you know, um, ranks and names, uh, and also ship to ship and fleet to fleet transfers of material, materiel spelt. The, the military way, with an E at the end, not an A, materiel. Um, and lots of exotic chemical names, you know, molybdenum, I can't even say that. Lots of really exotic chemical names. Um, and that led me to believe, it, it didn't mean non-terrestrial as in, you know, little green men or aliens. It was a space going force, maybe even just a low, low Earth orbit thing or something, but. Yeah, so it could suggest, non-terrestrial means what, off, off planet, yeah. right? So, yeah. um, you know, these, these officers apparently off, off planet, who knows what that means, that they are orbiting, orbiting the planet in, in some sort of craft or, um, you know, secret space program or whether they, they're out there and somewhere in the solar system or beyond, right? It could have been yeah. either. Yeah. Um, but I mean, most people have taken it to mean a, a secret space fleet, which is a logical assumption. Um, we have... You know, the CIA has secret satellites. The Defense Intelligence Agency has secret satellites. NASA launches military satellites. Elon Musk launches military satellites. So th there is already a secret space force in that manner. 
Um, but there was no hard evidence of a military space going force at that time. Although now they have recently formed the US Space Force, whatever it's called. Um, I don't pay a lot of attention to that stuff these days. Um, but yeah, so it could have been, you know, the secret, the, the early burgeonings of a secret space force. You think the, um, do you think the, the formation um, quite recently of a US space force is the beginnings of disclosure to, to perhaps non-terrestrial officers, perhaps? Um, I don't think disclosure will ever come from officialdom at all. I think it comes from people. <laughs> Probably a great point, and I think, as I was talking earlier about truth seekers, uh, I think that, that there really is a lot to say about people going out their way to, I mean, like, as you did, to, to find these, these nuggets of truth and, and to, to force out disclosure the best we can. But even then, you know, um, do, do these things get covered up and, and twisted and manipulated so that you, you still don't know what the truth is, you know? Um, interesting point. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a, a different arena, but, you know, Julian Assange is a great example of that. You know, if you're talking about whistleblowers and then their persecution uh, once they're caught. Not that he was caught, because he was a journalist. He wasn't doing anything wrong, but... So uh, going back to the um, the fleets the, the, of ships, right? So, so there was names of, of different ships. How, how many do you reckon there were? Um, I was on a 1024 by 768 monitor at the time. So this spreadsheet pretty much filled the screen. So it would have been about 24 rows in the default Excel row size format. So maybe yeah, 20, 30 names. So that's a lot of potential ships, even if they are float on the water, conventional ships, as we, as we say, to, to, to have them, uh, all these names of ships which are not public, that's, that's even a lot of um, boats, ships, uh, can, even if it's if, in the conventional manner, if they're hidden. Yeah, yeah, totally. And um, the personnel as well, I think that they went on for a bit longer, maybe one and a half pages. Um, but, and I think it was a Navy website, I found this on, not a website, it was, it was a private military networks. But um, quite small, which you, you might expect. If it is a secret space force, it's probably not going to be huge because um, it is early. It is you know, the birth of it, perhaps, as far as I know. Um, so, yeah, you know, 20-odd ships, maybe 40-odd personnel names, um, and then the strange material, chemical transfers. So, yeah, and so all in one spreadsheet. Wow. So, I mean, yeah, a lot of people could assume, uh, which, which I assume, that it's, so these two documents uh, linked or, or close by each other, like the non-terrestrial officers and, and the, the ships, were they, was these documents connected? One Excel spreadsheet and various tabs. Ah, so, so you've got a part of the document saying non-terrestrial officers and then these ships, so you could assume that they might potentially be off-world ships. Oh yeah, totally, and, and all linked, so you've got the ships, the personnel and material transfers. In wow. Yeah. And uh, so these ships, these ship names, they were, so they all start like USS. Uh, um, that's one of the things I don't remember. Um, they were ship names, but um, whether it was USS or. I, I think I, I, I did see um, uh, screen, screenshots, but the actual name bits been blurred out. I don't, I don't know if they're real or whether they are no, recreations. They're not real because uh, my hard drive went straight to ONI, Office of Naval Intelligence in Washington. So that's never been right. publicized. Yeah, because I saw on them, it was it, they said USS and then uh, it was blurred out the rest yeah. of it for each of the names. Which yeah. That's why I, I, you know, I asked about the names. There's been a lot of this. Um, what's, the, uh, what's the famous secret space fleet thing that people quote uh, Gary McKinnon discovered. I should know its name because I've, I've negated it so many times. Um, there's basically a rumor going around that it's, oh, I should, I should know this name. I've read it so many times. Um, thinking, thinking, <laughs> I can't bloody remember. But um, there's a famous secret space fleet theory that originated on ATS, Above Top Secret Forum. And I spent so much time on YouTube and the web saying, no, I did not discover that. I never saw that name. You know, it's all made up. Um, yeah, complete fail here from name remembrance. But uh. yeah, I, I'm not sure what you're talking about, so I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so 
with all this happening, uh, so so what happened after the the uh, the crime unit, the uh, cyber crime unit, or whatever you said they were, uh, they'd come. You, you had a, a lengthy legal battle, I guess, afterwards. Yeah, I had a couple of interviews with the NHTCU. And uh, then they went over to, and at first they presented it as, oh, you'll just do six months in jail tops under the Computer Misuse Act, 95 and 96. Um, or maybe even just community service, you know, a few weeks community service. But then they went to Washington and they visited the top brass in the Navy. And the Navy, by the way, interestingly, were the ones that seemed to handle most of this in my case. And there was no FBI involvement, even though it was international. And um, when NHTCU came back from Washington, they were, they got really heavy. They were obviously very impressed by Todd Brass in Washington. And, um, and then November of 2002, having been arrested in March, extradition threats came through. Well, extradition promise. Yeah. So it went from a few months in prison or possibly a few weeks cleaning the streets to eight to 20 years uh, picking up that soap boy. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so after a trip to the US, they were either impressed or spooked yeah. into going hard on, you know, what this means. Suddenly it became a, a you know, a big thing with perhaps huge punishments. Yeah. What do you, what do you think um, would have happened? Uh, obviously, you didn't get extradited in the end. So what do you think would have happened if, if they would have managed to extradite you? Um, they really wanted a poster boy. Um, for security, you know, like you try and hack us, this is what happens, which is kind of crazy, really. I mean, they called me the biggest military computer hacker ever, but there's been viruses that have gone to more computers than I have, so it's all just marketing. <laughs> so, it, it, yeah, their problem is more about what you potentially could have seen rather than uh, any sort of actual damages or anything. Yeah, or not even that, because the government isn't privy to all this UFO stuff. It's, you know, need to know basis. Um, it's more about the embarrassment, I think. Um, my friend Matthew Bevan, data stream cowboy, he went through a similar process in the 90s. And they called him the biggest threat to national security since Hitler. So, <laughs> yeah. So they're really overplaying. Yeah, they're always overplaying over state, the threat level. Um, yeah, it's part of the course. So uh, do you think it's possible if they would have managed to, to get you over there and extradite you? Do you think there's a possibility that they could have tried to hire you? You know, no, <laughs> not even uh, you know to to do some some lower level or even to to have contract with you to for you not to do these sort of talks. No, because um, I'm actually my arrest warrant is still live. I'm still on the Interpol red list by solicitor checks every now and then, so they couldn't be seen to be fraternising with the enemy, so to speak. Yeah, well, haven't the US government done that before uh, and hired people that were perhaps not while the arrest warrant's still alive no. oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> just um post-war uh oh yeah maybe, operation but, paper clear yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on nazis are fine yeah yeah scottish system administrators aren't <laughs> <laughs> they they tried to extradite you when, when did the they, they start saying about extradition was that that was around 2004 november 2002 Two, 2002 but what they did then they waited three years and my God, what a three years that was for us, my family and I. And um, what they actually did was they changed, because we, we had an old extradition treaty with America uh, from 89, I think. And uh, they changed the extradition treaty to account for all this computer law. And specifically, my case was the major influence. And we got one of the, the draft copies, the first draft copies of the new treaty. It was written in American English. <laughs> right. Even though it was a UK-US treaty. And um, lots of the phrases were specifically from my charge sheet. Um, I see. So I do apologise to everyone else that got prosecuted <laughs> under that treaty after me, because it's mainly my fault. You, you really think um, your case had a, a massive influence on that, and, and perhaps maybe yeah. even even the trigger and the reason they 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 did that. Yeah. Um, and am I to understand when they did that, they had the power to extradite uh, British citizens? but we didn't have the power to extradite US citizens in yeah. the same, same sort of matters. Yeah, very good point. Um, US citizens are protected by their constitution. And um, yeah, the other way around, it's just ridiculous. They need no evidence. All they have to do is charge you and say, that's your name, that's your address. These are the charges, you're coming over here. We can't do that with them at all. So it's a hugely imbalanced 
and it still is because the only thing we got introduced as a result of my case is something called the forum bar where in special circumstances you can get extended appeals and look in detail at the circumstances of your case um but yeah americans are still protected by the constitution like the lady who you know ran over that guy and killed him on his motorbike outside of the base um yeah yeah impossible to extradite they obviously didn't uh, end up extraditing you what, what happened there how did it end up getting blocked what was the circumstances around that um basically medical evidence was what what set me free um they said look this guy's clearly obsessive <laughs> Uh, clearly obsessive, you know, beyond his own good, just kept on going. Even in interviews, I was still banging on about, you know, US foreign policy and UFO truth and da da da. And uh, we had uh, one woman who'd been diagnosed with Asperger's for years contact the family and say, he's clearly got Asperger's, just, just look at him. And um, then it got assessed. And then they all said, yes, you have, you're high functioning, but you're on the spectrum. And then we had some government doctors assess as well. And there was a bit of toing and froing because everyone, every side has their expert witnesses, don't they? And we really had a mistrust of this one particular psychologist who I won't mention the name of because he's a bit lit litigious. <laughs> right. And um, so we stood our ground for a while. And then eventually, Theresa May, who was home sec at the time, um, disallowed the extradition. She barred it. So, yeah. So before they, they changed the extradition uh, laws, um, did did the uh, the US have to? Ha I believe they had to um, show that there was physical damages. Is that right, or, some, or something along those lines to get you? Yeah, there is there? a burden of proof legally. Yeah. Um, but the CPS, our own Crown Prosecution Service, you know, our version of the, the DOJ over there, um, asked them to show their side of the evidence, and there was nothing. And the CPS themselves said, "This is just hearsay. You know, there's, there's no computer logs. There's no because there was no damage. You know, obviously." The fact that I'd entered the systems and they had to shut them down and analyze them and delete my software or whatever, you could vaguely class that as damage because it's downtime. But there was no, I wasn't switching off machines because I had to, because I was going through multiple machines, I needed them all to be on to maintain my connection. So you didn't actually cause, you know, you didn't break these computers no. uh, or anything like that. But they did, am I right in thinking that they tried to uh, claim that you'd done £4,000 worth of damage <laughs> to each of the machines? Yeah, yeah. It turns out for it to be an extraditable computer offence, it had to be worth at least one year in prison. And to be worth at least one year in prison, you had to have done at least $5,000 worth of damage. So lo and behold, every machine I was on, I'd done exactly $5,000 worth of damage to <laughs> So a fit up to use an American term. Yeah, um, interesting. So, um, so I'm guessing they see that they when you said that they, uh, the the uh, crime unit uh, came to you, the cyber crime unit came to your house. They they seized your devices, uh, right? Yeah, and, and I guess that was all all of the devices in the in the household. Yeah, and these were the days you know before tablets and stuff and mobile phones were new. But I did have three of my computers plus uh, six computers that I was fixing for friends. Wow. <laughs> so my friends were pissed off as well. They took all those PCs. Um, but, yeah. did, did, they, did, you, uh, get all, did your friends get the devices back? Did you get yours back? And... Yeah, it took uh, not too long for my friends, I think two or three months. But my, one of mine I didn't get back for like two years. And uh, the police, British police, their funny sense of humour, um, <laughs> they sent back uh, my main hard drive on the main machine I used for the hacking but they sent it back. It was a, a forensic copy of my original hard drive, not my actual hard drive. And it was in the format that only the proprietary police forensic software can read. Oh, uh, wow. But, but luckily for me, I've got a friend who's got a copy of that software. So <laughs> he translated it for me. And it was, that, that's uh, handy to have yeah. those sort of friends. It was quite handy about that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm guessing that you weren't allowed to access the internet for a while. Yep, 2002. When was my internet banned? 2000 and... Thanks, Lou. <laughs> 2005 to 2012, yeah. Wow, uh, seven years then. Uh, yeah. not been able to... was that, is that no, not allowed to use computers or not, just not allowed to, to go online? Funnily enough, yeah, it was not allowed to be online, not allowed to use computers. Wow. Yeah. Mm. So this all kind of ended, uh, when did you say 2012? 12. 12. And... Uh, 
since then, what have you been doing? What's your what's your interests? What have you been looking into? Or Ooh, um, first thing I did was cried like a baby when we got the news <laughs> that we'd won. Years of you know stress and relief coming out, and uh, then just uh, a couple of years sitting on my ass, just feeling happy <laughs> that I wasn't in jail really. And then so 2014, I started my own company, um, small SEO, uh, doing search on my op- op- optimization for small businesses. Um, getting your products or services to page one of Google. Um, and that's been growing and doing fine uh, since then, yeah, 2014. Um, I'm not so interested in UFOs and stuff anymore. I mean, it's still an interesting topic. Um, but I have just, um, we just bought our first house and uh, I've got my first shed. I'm a real man now. <laughs> and um, I'm going to start on anti gravity experiments after the, the Biofield Brown start of things. It turns out if you have a capacitor charged to extremely high voltage, like 60,000 volts, 250,000 volts, it exhibits a net thrust in one direction or loses mass. And um, lots of people will tell you it's just air molecules and the wind is providing the lift. But there's lots of other experiments. Honda did one in 95. And the thing lost 3% mass in a bath of oil. So it isn't air movement because there's no air in the bath of oil. So, um, yeah, so running a small company and doing anti-gravity experiments. Like, they start next week. <laughs> wow. Uh, that is interesting. Uh, you know, yeah. Look forward to seeing what you come up with in your shed. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give the, the audience a chance to, to, you know, ask some questions. So, yeah. It's a weird one, but um, based on your sort of discoveries, um, I've got a friend who started to look into what shape the Earth is. <laughs> do you have any inklings or ideas yeah. or I mean, an opinion about that yeah i mean as far as my perception goes it's a globe because the moon's a globe jupiter's a globe you know but funny it's funny you asked that because yesterday i was chatting with a guy for three hours who doesn't call himself a flat earther he calls himself a globe skeptic <laughs> which is kind of middle of the road um and I said to him, ultimately, it's all very interesting, but ultimately, I don't care because it, you know, it's uh, it's not important in my life right now. Uh, but it is interesting. There's lots of experiments with lasers. Um, lots of you have to know a lot about optics to really dive into this. Um, yeah, it's interesting, but I don't really have an opinion. It's, it's like the moon landings. I used to think they were faked. Then I did a lot of research and found out that most of the conspiracy elements of the theory against the landings uh, can be easily debunked. Um, flat Earth, yeah, not in my life really. But interesting. It's interesting to discuss, and it's very educational because you have you have to really look into details to even have that discussion, especially with optics, lasers, gravity, etc. So interesting discussion. Yeah, but. Will it ever end? <laughs> okay. Right question. Uh, what do you think about the dark, dark side of the moon? Dark side of the moon. Brilliant album. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, interesting because um, there is, I think, Clementine mission photographed dark side of the moon. And I think the Japanese did do or plan to do a mission photographing the dark side. Um, but yeah, the moon's very interesting. I mean, lo- lots of the craters are actually polygonal. They're straight-sided hexagons, I think, or pentagons, ironically. I can't remember. Um, and also, if you look at these impacts that are apparently from space rocks, they're all straight down. None of them have a trail. None of them are oval. They're all like circular impacts straight down, you know, 90 degree impacts. Um, so that's interesting. The craters themselves are interesting. Uh, no scientist in the world has an explanation, geological or otherwise, um, for the fact that many of the craters are straight-sided. So that's weird. And there are structures on the moon, I'm convinced. My friend um, John Leonard Wilson, not his real name, he's on YouTube. Um, he's got a crazy telescope and uh, he's found some really interesting things. Uh, if you look him up on YouTube, John Leonard Wilson. Um, and watch all his videos. There are some things that are far too rectilinear and structured on the moon to be natural geological formations. So, yeah, the moon's interesting. Okay. 
Chris. Yes. How you doing, pal? Nice one. Yes, I can't wait to have you on my podcast. Yes. Uh, Cool, man. Uh, mate, you posted a photo the other day. I think it's on Twitter. You and your mate, and you look pretty stoned. <laughs> oh, we were high as fuck. And it just brought back so many memories. <laughs> of, of, like, like, either you were there or you weren't there, you know? Yeah. Uh, um, oh, by the way, I've been permanently banned from Twitter now. Wee, badge of honor. I, I, I've got you anyway, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, me too, Chris. It's been very special for me. And um, yes, freedom. Whee. <laughs> well, we'll have a pint in a bit. <laughs> Any other questions out there? I've got, I've got one. Um, okay. What do you think about, I, I heard you speak a little bit about this on, on another interview. We have, a bit, we have, have we ever been to the moon? What do you think? Yeah, I used to think, <laughs> I used to think, God, this is... Unlikely for so many reasons. Um, a, there was a big race with the Russians and it would have been a great propaganda coup to say we did it. And also, if you look at the tools that we use, apparently using sextants to get to the moon. Astronauts in a spaceship using a sextant to get to the moon. Like, what the fuck? Um, and also, the rocket program itself, even when Von Braun, the paperclip Nazi guy, although he said he was never a Nazi, he just had to say he was just to get his job. Um, so many failures. So many failures in the standard conventional rocket program. And then suddenly the Apollo missions, really high level of success, which is kind of weird, because it's so much easier to launch a rocket than to get it to the moon, land your lunar module, which looked like it was made of papers, you know, matchsticks and <laughs> baker foil. Um, but I, I did check out a lot of the, the main conspiracy elements, and they are debunkable. Um, you know, like the, the battery being able to last in full sunlight, stuff like that. Um, but again, a, a bit like the, the flat earth thing, ultimately now I don't really care <laughs> if we went to the moon or not, because it's not. I mean, it would be incredible to be revealed as a big lie, because then it would make people question a lot of other stuff, um, as, as is want to happen with conspiracies. It's like a, the domino effect, isn't it? Well, if they lied about that, then... Um, but ultimately, I, I'm, I'm more concerned with um, consciousness now and, and the betterment of, of us as a species rather than all the, the shiny stuff. Yeah, and, and we can't really sort of, uh, you know, investigate much now because we don't have the technology anymore, right? Yeah, apparently we lost the, the way to get to the moon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we lost it. We've... Including 14,000 um, telemetry tapes or whatever it was that recorded everything. That's right. They conveniently disappeared, right? So they... They only have uh, the the footage that was broadcast to the TV and a certain set of images. Yeah. Um, but you'd think they'd, they'd have backups, they'd have, I mean, you know, that's all disappeared conveniently as well. So, yeah, yeah very interesting. Uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, My pleasure. Just go back to the audience. Are there any other questions before before we wrap up? Go for it. What, what do you think about Elon Musk? Why, why do they send so many satellites up there? Um, <laughs> I mean, he's obviously a huge character and they're always to be suspected, I think, when you're that global and uh, you have that kind of, kind of power. But he does launch military satellites. That's another fact. Um, so, I don't know, are his morals questionable? Does he just support defense in his country? Although I know he's South African in origin. Um, and also I think when you reach that level, uh, you do get pressure, pressure that you probably can't speak about that you're having. Um, so you, you have to start to do things that you may not want to do, just like, um, what's the name, the guys that own Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, if you get that big, you're under pressure and maybe even controlled to some extent. So it's, it behoves all of us to um, to keep a watch on these people, I think. Keep an eye on them. Okay. Gary, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to talk to you, listen to your story. Thank you for sharing that with us all. Um, Cheers, Mike. <laughs>
Yeah, and uh, you know, thank you guys for listening to my ramblings on at the beginning. Brilliant um, to meet you, and yeah, thank you very much, Gary McKinnon, everyone. Cheers, thank you. Notice I called you Mike to keep it a secret. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go by him. Where, where'd you want your mic, Mike? <laughs>